going to open up panel discussion, um, which for the benefit of the audience, we're going to have the three companies that we just heard from, Chalice, DGO, and Lafroy. We're going to have Ross on, and um, uh, we're going to have Merlimar Johnson, who wrote the Discovery White Paper that helps us to decipher these fabulous words like flamboidal something or other that Ross just mentioned. Uh, and we also have Ned, who's the man with the billion dollars sitting in his precious metals fund in London. Um, Merlin, I'm going to invite you to ask a question of the panelists first. Um, over to you. Simon, thanks. Um, gentlemen, really great um, talks. I've actually got uh, two questions. Um, perhaps I'll start with uh, Ross. Um, you've been talking about the, the kind of the, the game change in geochemistry. And yet, actually, when you look back at the recent track record of discovery in uh, in the exploration sector, the, the, the rate of large discoveries has dropped off dramatically in the last 10-15 um, years. All the kind of the, the big deposits were um, found in the um, 70s, 80s and possibly in the 90s. And so there's been very little of the kind of the major um, discoveries that have come through. So when you talk about this kind of the change in the ease of access to or kind of interpretive ability of the geochemistry, what's the kind of the lag time you know, and how long is it going to take before you see those techniques being applied to the next generation of major discoveries? I don't think there's much of a lag. I, I, I read it a little bit differently. I, I think the last 18 months has seen a pickup in discovery rate, and that's going to continue for the next several years. And as um, Ned said before, I think that we just haven't had much exploration. We haven't implied the new technology that we now have. And I, I see geochemistry approaching the value of geophysics, uh, where you can target below cover and, and discover all deposits. Um, so I, I, my feeling is that we're not going to have a big lag, that there's going to be new discoveries coming online within the next uh, 12 to two years, to one to two years, and this will build up. We'll, we'll see an increase. I, I'm very excited about the next seven years. Uh, I think there's, with the new technologies and the aggressive nature of exploration and the good investment uh, atmosphere that we have now, I think we're in for a real good run. Thank you. That, that's really interesting. And of course, yeah, Julie Maher is, is, is a big discovery and um, Hemi as well. So they are, you're right, they are coming through. Um, Ned, I've got a question for you, if I may. Um, you talk about uh, leverage, and momentum, and narrative, and you say that we haven't really seen the momentum yet uh, in the sector. And yet, if you look at the metal prices for the last uh, 12 months, we've seen some spectacular gains where, gains where all time highs in the copper prices, uh, gold is retouching its highs. Um, do you see that there's further to go in underlying metal prices? And of course, there's this. Uh, we, to us in the junior sector or the resources sector, it feels like a um, this is a bit of a bull market. Are you so when you talk about the momentum hasn't actually come through? Are you saying we ain't seen nothing yet? I mean, how do you what do you see in terms of timelines and the impact on particular metal prices underneath? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's absolutely the foothills, Merlin. Um, we we've not seen anything really. All that happened is that last year. I mean, it's slightly different for me because I, I focus on gold and silver. So, I, you know, I'm, I have to really narrow in a bit on that. But, but I tend to think that also that leads the interest into the other, the other commodity exploration end. You know, I think it's, it's sort of the focus. All that happened is that last year, the market got overly dovish relative to the Fed's guidance. So the Fed's been very sort of even in its guidance, which is rates at zero, let inflation run hot, not going to do anything. And the market got over dovish last year for a bit and was talking about negative rates that drove some some money into um, gold and silver. And you saw, you know, Citadel, the big, big hedge funds take levered positions in, in indices like GDX, GDXJ, et cetera. Uh, so that was your that was your your momentum and your leverage in, but it wasn't that big. It was pretty minor, really. There's a bit of tourism for, for a while. And then the market got overly haw uh, yeah overly hawkish relative to the flatlining guidance for the last six or seven months what what you saw then was all of it came back out again 
Um, and you know, the market now, I'm afraid, is just it's just an absolutely, you know, moronic single cell beast that can't focus on anything for more than about three seconds. And when it attaches itself to the issue of um, purchasing power, and it feels like it's getting closer now. You know, the market's definitely more interested in inflation. But remember that the, the bond market's also been pricing in hikes, which aren't going to happen. So that's why we haven't seen it really happen yet uh, in gold and silver, because, of course, they're driven off real interest rates. But, you know, I think it will be it will that will get a frenzy, just like you see in other areas. You know, I mean, look at look at look at your Teslas and all the rest of it. You know, it's it, the market loves nonsense and loves speculation. And, you know, certainly you'll see a whole bunch, in my opinion, you'll see a whole bunch of absolute turkey exploration stocks fly like eagles in due course. Um, which hopefully doesn't involve anybody here, by the way. Um, but, you know, I think it will happen. And it's, yes, it's still very, very early in the overall trend, in, in, in our view. Uh, nice one, Ned. Enjoyed those answers. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, each of the mining company CEOs, so Ed from GGO, Alex from Chalice, and Wade from Lafroy, could you each gentleman around the, the table or the Zoom webinar, tell us what are the tools that you use to give your company an edge? Is it technology? Is it the insider or experience that, that Ned had referred to? What is it that makes your exploration efforts better than others? Um, Ed, maybe, maybe start with you if that's all right. Are you muted, Ed? Uh, thanks, Simon. Uh, as as I indicated uh, earlier, I think um, for us in particular is the focus on Australia and in particular in Western Australia. When you accept the fact that large areas are under cover and are very lightly explored, and and we're seeing this coming through in in our discussion today, and you see it on a on a regular basis. Our view is to, uh, is to, if we can, to obtain and lock in large land positions. And that can be directly or invest in companies that have large land positions. And that's why the grey, you know, on many fronts, clearly meets that criteria, as does, as does uh, Dacian in a, in a relative sense, and Yandel also. Um, we, we like to think about what might be discovered before it's discovered and uh, and what it would cost to do that. And that, that process um, in, uh, you know, in each case uh, requires us to look at the existing resources, to look at the uh, potential ex ex extensions. This is in, in the brownfield space, to look at the extensions, to look at what hasn't been found and where it could be found. And if it was to be found, how much it would cost. And so we actually get as, as part of the process, as part of the process of zeroing in on the grey as, uh, as our number one investment, you know, three years ago, it it hit the spot. It hit the spot in terms of scale. It hit the, the, the spot in terms of the likely low cost of uh, finding ounces. You know, we all know that if you can find ounces at $10 an ounce and the market values at at $100 plus an ounce, that that's actually a really good business uh, to be in. Um, as we've demonstrated over and over again, I think you get an edge by engaging with uh, with the academics, with the research specialists. And, and as I said during my presentation, that's something that uh, you know, I've been doing for the last 40 years and uh, it, it works if you accept the advice and then take the risk accordingly to, to test the advice that, uh, that you're getting. Um, I guess finally, um, my experience is that we get an edge by in fact, doing core drilling early and understanding the geology early. And so in each, in each case, um, like like now at Briar, we're core drilling in an area where hasn't where there hasn't been any core drilling 
for at least 50 years, if not longer. And the information we're getting out of those holes support, support our, our thinking and strengthen our knowledge and strengthen our ability to analyze what's, what's happening there. Sometimes it's quite unexpected. And sometimes it's, uh, it's much better than what you expect. And sometimes you say, okay, well, uh, we actually need to move on. So this proof of concept drilling with core drilling is a really critical element of early success. And uh, so I think they're, they're, the, they're the key points, Simon. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Alex from Chalice, what would your answer be to the question, how do you gain an edge? How does Chalice uh, make itself successful for, as one of the world's best exploration companies? So I think it was um, three things for us, Simon. There was, um, I think you mentioned it at the very, very start. You've got to pick your trend. You have to be exploring for commodities that are going to be in demand. So about <clears throat> three years ago, four years ago, we set about finding a nickel sulfide asset and uh, we quickly worked our way down the list of development ready nickel sulfide plays globally and didn't, didn't find uh, much at all that was, uh, that was basically sitting there ready to be bought. So we, that's what led us to peg you know, very large license holdings all around WA for, for nickel sulfide. So we, 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 we picked that trend that we wanted to be in and, and we, we, made a, we made a big bet of the company, I guess, into, into nickel sulfide. The second thing I think as what Tim alluded to is risk appetite. You've got to be willing, you've got actually got to be willing to uh, bet the company and put your livelihood on the line. And I think that's what we, we did. We, we had a decent balance sheet to play around uh, with, um, with exploration, but we did bet the company on the, on, the, on, the, on the outcome. So a lot of companies out there, you know, say they have the risk appetite, but they frankly just don't spend their money. And, and investors are demanding companies to spend the money. Um, so that, that's one of the things we've, we've done, you know, we've done, we've spent heavily and we've, and that leads me to the third point, which I think is that you have to iterate quickly and you have to fail fast. It's a bit like the pharmaceutical business. You, you, you get it wrong as quickly as possible because it is a numbers game. You're only going to deliver a fantastic discovery, one out of every hundred attempts. If you're really good, maybe one out of 50. So you have to be willing to, to really iterate quickly and get to that failure on the 49 uh, so that then when you, when you have the 50 come up, you're, uh, you're in a good position to capitalise. I, I think it's all those three things. And then on, on top of that, of course, you have your, the science, you have the best, the best smarts in your company and, and you need some luck as well. Like, honestly, I think that's, the, that's really what, uh, what drives exploration success. Uh, very comprehensive, Alex, and uh, that makes complete sense. Uh, Wade Johnson from Lefroy, what would be your answer to the question, how do you and how does Lefroy Exploration gain an edge in finding big ore bodies? Yeah, thanks, Simon, and um, yeah, probably get along with a couple of those points that um, Alex and, and Ed put out are probably a bit of a common theme, but I, I guess one of the key things, I guess one of the great things for, you know, for Lefroy is, um, I guess, you know, the first thing you're going to get is the land, so you've got to pick the areas you want to be in. Um, and I guess our ground monitoring and, and I guess knowing the areas you want to be in and constant monitoring of the land, you know, picking up the land and getting land and getting land granted, getting access to land quickly is very important. And I guess that's what we've done with the Burns discovery. We, you know, we got it to monitor that ground for a very long period of time, watched and waited and uh, pounced when the opportunity came, got the heritage survey done, got the ground cleared on the ground within six months, drilling made a discovery. So I think that's important. I go along with that. I definitely agree that diamond drilling, drilling diamond early is um, very important. And that's one thing we've done. Both the discovery made at Lucky Strike, um, did the air core drilling, no RC, straight to straight to diamond, made that that small, but a gold discovery, um, a virgin gold discovery at Lucky Strike. And then the same thing, what we're doing at Burns, I think, uh, like Alex said, I think, um, yeah, we're doing the diamond drilling early, understanding the system. Um, and we're certainly taking some risk drilling these really, really big deep holes without any, any results. I think diamond drilling early and the ability to pick up land and monitor land to pick up land. Um, and I agree with that, getting uh, academics and, and the government involved in assisting with the exploration. They can do all the academic, they can do all the research and we take the key, 
points out of that to use ex to get you know to guide our explorations, make mineral discoveries. So um, I think they're really important. And I think probably the one key thing also is patience. <laughs> I mean, with Lefroy, we've been, we've picked our ground, the area we wanted to be in. We've been there for, you know, for the, the long haul, five years we've been there, still doing the exploration. Um, and I guess, you know, been in the exploration game a long time. And I think a, a key one is, you know, picking the bones, as I call it, is really going over old ground that people have been there before, such as Burns, you know, companies have been there before. Um, and looking at areas where we think we can pick something that the other companies may have missed having observed the right things and seeing that, and that, that all comes with experience um, and then guiding the exploration from that. So I think, um, yeah, diamond drilling early is, is very important to understand the rock types, um, patience, taking some risk. And you know, I guess the key thing is if you don't have the land, you're not exploring. So getting ability to get ground and getting ground cheaply and getting access to the ground is very important. Thank you, Wade. Um, uh, we're now going to wrap this uh, panel discussion up, and I'm conscious we have got half a dozen questions which folk have sent through. Um, just in the interest of time, could I ask that you email either uh, myself, scatter, agam.co.uk, or Danica at Investability, uh, and let us know your question and the company for whom the question is directed, and we will try and get you an answer.